And um, our final um, live session this afternoon is Jez Casey, who's an actor, a playwright, and a literary manager. Uh, I'm not sure which role he's going to be in today. Um, I'm looking for tears as little Nell dies. Um, and he's going to talk to us about beaplaywright.com and about the evolution of the project moving online from offline, what they've done to create material and how that's engaging with audiences in ways that are about encouraging other people to tell their stories rather than just telling the story themselves. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am uh, the literary manager of Live Theatre. Um, I thought before uh, I go into uh, beaplaywright.com, which is our online uh, script writing course, I should put um, uh, the, uh, the organisation I work for into a context. Um, that is, um, we're going to talk about later on, beaplaywright.com, that's the, uh, the home page. Um, I work at Live Theatre, which if you're not familiar with Newcastle, is a beautiful building down on the quayside. Um, we were closed uh, for a, a renovation about three or four years ago, uh, and we got bigger. We acquired the building next door, so we've recently kind of expanded. We've got two spaces down there. We've got a main house, which is 160-seater, and we've recently acquired um, a studio theatre, which is uh, on our top floor, which is 60 seats. Uh, and we're a new writing company, um, one of very few in the country, um, and our mission statement is uh, is very clear we um we have to create and perform new plays of world class quality we have to try and find and develop creative talent uh, and we unlock the potential of young people uh, through theater so we obviously uh, the second one of that um of those missions um we have to find new ways of uh, finding and developing uh, creative talent all the time so that's something to bear in mind when we get on to talking about beaplaywright.com um, I'll just go through a couple of the things that we do that, um, that kind of reinforce our mission. Uh, First Draft is, a, is a, pro a project we do with uh, local schools. We go into schools and find writers, uh, embryonic playwrights, who are nine and ten years old, uh, years four and five. And our education and participation uh, uh, department works with the young writers. They bring the writers into the theatre. We employ professional actors. Uh, and uh, directors to give them uh, a proper production and they do um, a series of 10 minute uh, plays with um, usually two handers and they're performed to the highest possible standards that we can we can apply um, and that's just part of the work that we do in our educational participation department we go out uh, and invite also uh, invite young people into our building we run 10 different uh, uh, sessions a week uh, eight of them in the building and two out in the community uh, and we have something like 200 people a week engaging with the department, and we have a waiting list of a similar number. Um, my job as literary manager uh, is to find and nurture uh, creative talent, and we do this uh, by engaging with writers in a, in a variety of different ways. Um, we have a, a, a thing called Live Lab, which is like a developmental uh, arm of the company where we put work on in our studio space, and we hope to uh, do dramaturgical support for writers at all stages of their career. And we also um, teach uh, an introduction to playwriting course, which I'll come back to later on. And of course, in the main house, we have, um, we have our main productions. Uh, when, the, um, when the building reopened uh, three or four years ago, uh, it opened with a Lee Hall play, The Pitman Painters which was a massive success, and has moved from uh, our stage at Live. It's gone on to uh, the National, uh, and from the National, it went to Broadway last year, and is currently on tour, uh, I think, at Blackpool this week, maybe, uh, and is coming back to the West End in the, uh, in the autumn. So I suppose the theatre company does a whole range uh, of, of disparate uh, but coherent activities. Um, and my job uh, as the literary manager, one of the, the things that I've been doing for the last few years, is from 2002, we've been running an introduction to playwriting course um, with my predecessor, um, Jeremy Herrin, who's now a deputy artistic director of the Royal Court. Uh, Jeremy and I uh, ran, ran the course for a number of years. Um, we had probably about 120 people take part uh, of all abilities, 
And from those, um, from those people who took part in the course, uh, we had uh, about nine or ten professional commissions. Um, so uh, it seemed to be working rather well. Um, and so we thought, how could we roll out um, that, that course that we do, that we teach at the, at the, uh, the theatre? How could we roll that out uh, online so that other people could have access to it? And perhaps also think about an income stream, as, um, as I'm sure um, lots of people in the room are aware, funding opportunities are becoming more restricted. And so uh, arts organisations have to look for alternative income streams, how to maybe ch uh, charge people to come and uh, witness the content of our course, make it adaptable so that they can engage with it, and perhaps earn some money for the theatre company uh, to enable it to, um, to put its plays on in the main house and the studio, and to continue to further develop and support writers in the region. So um, we set about um, adapting the content of the course to uh, the online course. Um, we kind of uh, rationalised the old content, uh, content of, the, of the previous course into a five modular structure. This, um, these uh, are the modules here, you can see here. Um, uh, getting started, where, where we uh, ask people to uh, do a skills audit about themselves as writers, uh, how they work best and what would motivate them, the sort of themes that they might think about writing. Uh, to think seriously about dramatic structure, uh, and incorporate um, the old adage that there are only three rules to writing a play or telling a story, and that's structure, structure, and structure. And also to think about character. How do you make your, your, your characters three-dimensional and believable? Uh, dialogue and theatricality. What makes, your, uh, what makes your writing different from writing a screenplay or writing for television? And finally, getting it produced, the last um, module, which is about thinking strategically about where you place your script, getting it finished, thinking about rewrites, and overcoming writer's block. So um, in the adaptation of our course the that Jeremy Heron and I taught, um, we had to think about what it is that makes uh, a playwright. What is it, um, what is it and what does an embryonic playwright want to learn? Now, obviously, Jeremy and I had, um, had the content of the course, but um, it's not an exa exact science becoming a playwright. And in fact, what we're, what we're kind of after is for people to think individually. So we wanted to create a variety of, of voices. So there obviously our voices, Jeremy and mine, were as part of the course, but also people might want to hear how other writers go about tackling those issues that I've just mentioned. So what we decided to do is to create some video content of really top um, playwrights that we really admired and also had something interesting to say, and to begin to analyse how they tackle the issues that we raise in the course. So we wanted to encourage people to be, have access to a diversity of working methods. And the way in which we did this, we set about interviewing um, interesting writers, um, and we our first list of people uh, are on the screen now, uh, Lee Hall, uh, who was uh, associated with our company uh, quite, quite a lot. Uh, he wrote The Pitman Painters and obviously has written an opera in Bridlington that you might have heard a bit about <laughs> most recently. Um, uh, Sheila Stevenson, um, is, she's written uh, The Memory of Water and she wrote a lovely piece for us last year about the artist Winslow Homer. Um, Nick Grosso is, is a, a young youngish playwright who works in a very unconventional way, so we wanted to talk to him. He's written Peaches and Ingredient X, which was on at the Royal Court last year. Um, the late Alan Plater, who had a long association with us uh, and is a master storyteller, and we thought that he would obviously have great skills and great advice to impart to embryonic writers. Polly Stenham, who's very young. Um, uh, she's still only 20 or 21, I think. She had a massive hit with her first play, That Face, at the Royal Court a few years ago, and that also transferred to Broadway. And Anthony Nielsen, who uh, is a writer and director. He creates work in a completely different way, quite often through improvisation. So it was about compiling a list of and a, a variety of information that people and students would have access to. Uh, in order to... Um, in order that we were singing from the same hymn sheet, as it were, we asked people on the course to read the same plays. 
so that we have a common currency uh, that we can keep referring to in the content of the course. So those were the six plays that we asked people to read. We don't ask them to read them all at once, but they read them gradually as the course progresses. Obviously, each of those plays has something uh, new uh, to offer to uh, the embryonic writer. And um, we also created some audio content. We got a group of people who um, have been involved in some productions with, of those plays to discuss them. Uh, and we have those on the website as podcasts so that people um, who are interested in, um, have just read the, the play, have a, another angle to, to analyze it with by listening to that content. And so, um, we had all of the content, and then we had to kind of think about how uh, best to kind of marshal it so that um, people could get the best use out of it. Um, so we used, um, we used testers, and we used uh, a focus group, and we gave them the material that we'd compiled and asked them what they thought about it. And they provided us with um, a couple of things that we hadn't thought about. Um, they wanted a kind of um, a dash. We thought of a dashboard, a kind of home page for each student to go back to. It's almost like a sort of Facebook uh, home page, where you could um, update your status and also um, say how you were progressing and leave comments about the course, communicate with other with other students. Uh, we created a series of uh, forums where people could exchange opinions uh, and also work if they wanted to. Uh, and again, talk to their fellow cohort of students uh, and also have an interaction with the people who created the course, Jeremy and I. So every two weeks, uh, we have a live chat with students uh, uh, online. And also, uh, they said that they wanted to, uh, to have a sense of um, collecting what they, their work that they'd done. So um, they came up with this idea of an online journal, which is where... Um, the modules have a series of exercises uh, dotted throughout them, and your answers to those exercises, you can download uh, and keep them in, in your online journal, and you can slowly accumulate a whole wealth of uh, written material as you progress through the course. And we also... Um, we tried to suss out what uh, other competition there was out there, and actually there are very few. There are very few um, courses that we could compare ourselves with. Uh, there's open university um, modules, uh, and what it would cost to do a kind of course at um, at a university or a part of a course at a university. And so we came up with two. Um, we came up with two pricing structures. Um, as you can see, uh, there was an interactive option, which is. Um, the, uh, the exercises that I've mentioned, at the end of each module, you have a bridging exercise, which you submit to uh, us at the theatre, and our literary department will pass on um, uh, informed uh, opinion about the, the, uh, about the exercise and then feed it back to you, and then you carry on. And the last module, the final and fifth module, we're asking people at the end to write a whole play. Uh, we hope that the knowledge that people have accumulated over all of the modules gives them a toolkit that they can use to um, they can use to write a play at the end of the final module, and they submit in the interactive version they submit that um, that play to the department, and we will provide a, a very detailed critique about the quality of the play, uh, about what um, how the play. Uh, reflects the course, how much they have learnt, maybe where the, some of the weaknesses of the play may be, and also to offer some advice about where they could place the play if they wanted to have it done professionally. And the solo option, um, which is, uh, uh, as you can see, is cheaper, uh, that doesn't involve uh, the interaction. Um, it doesn't have, you don't have interactive access to the forums, and there wouldn't be the same interaction with the theatre to provide the kind of feedback from the course. But you do still do have access to all of the video content and the audio content that's on, that's on the site. OK, so um, uh, that's the course. Um, what, um, what I'd like to do now is, um, is perhaps show you some of the video content rather than just hear me speak. Um, Mm. Is it 
It's got to be there somewhere. That's not it. Video stream. That's there it. You go. Brilliant. Okay, um, as you can see, um, Stan Laurel and Ronnie Barker weren't available uh, to do the introductions, but we got uh, Jeremy and I did them instead. And uh, uh, these are some of the um, some of the little video clips that we did of the extensive interviews that we did with the writers. This first one is with Sheila Stevenson. Just a little short uh, clip. And Sheila's explaining about how difficult it is, um, even for a writer as esteemed as she is, to, um, to write. I think, you, I think basically you probably just sit at your desk till your head bleeds, really. That's yeah. probably what the key is. And, and it's all right if you can't do it. I think that's what you have to own, the bits where you can't do it, where you just think, I don't know how to do this. Mm. I can't write any single play I've ever written. There's a point where I can't write it. And then I phone up my agent and tell her I've, I'm not, I can't write plays anymore and I'm going to bed. I'm always going to bed. Or, I'm not, I, can't write, or I can't write this play and I've given up and it's, it's all gone horribly wrong. And it's, this is the third draft and it's worse. And she's just, you know, what, she what, just says, you always do this. Do you remember you always to? do this? So um, one of the things that we um, were anxious to, to show the, the writers um, is is the difficulties even um, great artists have and the different approaches that they have. All these uh, videos are from... I personally don't get one. Uh, are, from, um, ..are from the first module. So this is the module in which we're asking people to evaluate what kind of writer they are and how you might go about starting to create that play that you want to write. Um, this, is, um, this is Polly Stenham, uh, who I say... I uh, has only been writing for a short period of time. She's still very young, but she's had great success and uh, has a really interesting way of writing. Um, and this is what she says about uh, how to start. Personally, don't get one clear idea. I really envy people who get one clear idea, but I don't. I think the best way to describe it, and this is nicking it totally from another writer, Philip Ridley, is it's like a backwards explosion. And you start with lots of little bits of detritus and then it kind of pulls back into something more singular. So I, I can't really answer that question because it's never—it's not the one thing, really, I don't think. So when you sit down to write or when you sit down to apply yourself to this idea, what do you do? I just sort of freestyle. I know that's a weird word, but I just sort of write anything that comes into my mind and write lots and lots and lots and listen to lots of music and do lots of drawings and kind of gather and forage and then look, then stop and look at what I have and then peel away and then do it again and then peel it away and then eventually, I mean, it's a very long process for me. Other writers write quicker, I think. Um, I get to see what I really meant all along. But perhaps you become clearer with the, about that with maturity, but I don't know. OK, so these... Are, these um, I'll show you a couple more, but these are all... Um, videos from, as I say, the same module, and each of the five modules has particular uh, videos that um, that are tailored for that particular subject that's un under under discussion. Um, here's um, here's Nick Grosso, and this is how Nick. These are all from Making a Start, so this is how Nick goes about uh, pursuing an idea, or not. or not, as the case may be. All right, maybe we'll come back to Nick. Uh, let's hear from uh, Lee, because he hasn't been in the news very much recently. Oh. Just try the network again. Sorry about yep. that. It might have tied up. Uh, 
Uh, funny thing happened to me on the way to the cinema. Okay, let me just try it. Great, okay. It's all right. Should I just tell you literally what I do? I yeah. literally have a huge... If I've got an idea for a play or a screenplay or something, I'm kind of... I think about it for quite a long time. And generally, and this is some, another thing that Tom Stoppard says, that generally you get one idea and it's not quite enough. And then you get another idea and suddenly a play is when there's like almost two ideas coming together. Um, I'd always thought, for instance... Um, a lecture would is an, uh, a seldom used form of theatre, but it's like a theatre. It just happens in universities all the time. People stand up with a with a bit of a sign and something like that. And I've always been puzzling how you could use that in a not a very arid way to be a theatrical form. And then, and I've also and also uh, I'm sort of obsessed about class and art and all of the things that I keep going back to. Um, and then when I found the the Pitman painter, suddenly I realised that there was a form here that could be a lecture, but it could be actually fun and animated and, and, and it could be a lecture about this other thing. Um, and because these two ideas came together, then um, uh, there seemed to be a play there. But So what I do, once I've got a rough idea of these two ideas or, 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 or the, the landscape of it, I get a huge bit of paper... And then I just uh, free associate. And I think that, well, if I'm going to tell a play about a boy who does ballet in the pit village, I think, well, he's going to have to talk to his uh, teacher. So I write a scene between the boy and his teacher. <laughs> and yeah. his dad's going to find out and he's going to have an argument with him. I write argument with the dad. And, and, and by the end of like an hour, if you ask that basic question, what's going to happen in, in, in any given scenario? And you probably end up with 20 or 30 different ideas for scenes. Mm. And when I went back recently to do my old papers, I found that sheet of Billy Elliot. And every single scene that's in the musical now is, is on that bit of paper because right. it's bleeding obvious. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's yeah, not yeah. like rocket science. You yeah, think yeah. he's got to talk to somebody. He's got to talk to his little mate and he's going to ask him the question. And then, then I start to organise and, and, and say, well... If I've got all these things, what's going to happen first? Is he going to have an argument with his dad first, or is he going to talk to the teacher? And then asking those really dumb questions, you start to find the implied narrative. And quite often, you'll change it as you go later on, but, but you can start to see. And, and then I literally draw it. So, so he sees his mom, and then he goes down to that, and he goes down to that. And then sometimes you don't know what... You can't decide whether this should come before that, and I kind of... I've got these alternative timelines and stuff. So by the end of that process, I know what my scenes are going. I'm thinking about the characters all the time, although I'm not really. I'm I'm looking at the the structure. But a lot of the question a lot of the questions about the characters are answered by what you what I've discovered on my timeline, as it were. Because we know that his dad's gonna have to be a certain type of dad so he can have the argument with them. Yeah. So, yeah, he's not going to be the, the type of, uh, you know, little dad who's taking him to the ballet lessons. Obviously, he's, yeah. going, to be, he's going to have to be something else. So loads of, loads of questions will start getting answered without you having to actually think about them and right. invent them. Hmm. Um, and then when I've got all that, then I start, then I start doing other research about it, what, what's actually, what was it actually like in 1984 and... and and, and Easington and stuff, and, and getting pictures and looking at documentaries about how they train ballet dancers and stuff. Yeah. And doing that type of background research then informs, oh, well, I couldn't possibly do that, but that's wrong because the ballet dancers don't, don't do that. So then you start refining it. But really all the work of writing the play is being done subconsciously at that point. You're using this thing to sort of somehow get a grasp of the situation. And in a sense, I think what you should do is write something that's important to you. OK. Um, so you can see that the, the, um, the videos themselves are quite practical. They're about um, giving people um, a real insight into how these writers, these particular writers work. I think... Um, We'll try again with Nick because he's quite interesting 
Starts with furniture. I normally get an idea. Uh, it, 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 it really usually involves tables and chairs, um, and by that I mean like uh, just the place. So the so I so so I think of the place and the people. Like for example, if it is a table and chairs, that I just imagine the table and the people that are sitting on those chairs. That's usually the 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 basis of the play. That's how it forms in my mind. And. And so then what happens then? You get the place. Yeah, so then I get, this, I, I get the place, um, I get the people, and then I, I just get them talking to each other. And I like to see what happens between those people, what, what, what develops. However, with this play, it was a little bit different in the sense that I kind of I had more of a long-term picture of what was going to happen and where it was going to go. But that's not always the case. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I have no idea where they're going to take this. And sometimes I'll start something and it doesn't take me anywhere. So I just, I don't take it any further. And then sometimes I find a place and people who will, you know, I can sustain or they will sustain me long enough to get to the end of a play. Great. So as you can see, there's a whole... Uh, there's a whole variety of different bits of advice being offered because, as I mentioned earlier on, um, what we're trying to encourage is an individu the individual voice of a playwright with something new to say and in an interesting way. So I suppose ideally what we're thinking will happen um, is that people will pick little things from all of the different bits of material that they get and think, well, that applies to me, even if that doesn't apply to me. So they're gradually kind of accumulating the evidence uh, the, the, the stuff that they'll need in order to, to fashion their play. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, uh, there are a number of podcasts. I'll just show you, just play a little bit maybe from a podcast. This is the um, a group discussion about Three Sisters. Check off. OK, this is The Three Sisters uh, by Anton Chekhov. And it was first performed in 1901. So um, where should we start? Um, I suppose what we want to concentrate on are um, some things that are, that are in the play that might be useful to um, budding writers. Um, Steve? Well, the most significant thing about, I think, about this play and other Chekhov plays, and this isn't an, an, an original idea, I, th I think it was something that was quite shocking for audiences at the time, is that Chekhov, this play in particular, um, there is a lack the lack of kind of narrative action and the foregrounding of um, the uh, of character, the emotional lives of character and ideas being kind of discussed and explored in a, in a range of interesting ways. Um, and I think that's in, important be because I think writers get very caught up with the the idea that they need to have a a driving um, narrative because that's the vehicle that's going to kind of carry everything else um, with it. And a th okay, um, sorry, that's just a little in extract from that. Um, and I suppose what we're doing is accumulating um, all the pieces of information from the writers and also things that could be learned from these classic texts and building them together so that there's a kind of learning process for the uh, for the course members to follow. Uh, and here's just a kind of summation of what all of the course uh, is about. You will get a unique username and password to log onto the course. When you do, you will be presented with a home page that you can personalize by uploading an image to represent yourself. You also have the ability to update your status, view your progress on the course and see who else is online. The course has been specifically written by myself, Jez Casey, the literary manager at Live Theatre, and my predecessor, Jeremy Herrin, now Assistant Artistic Director at the Royal Court. The course is designed to be a straightforward, step-by-step -step guide to the craft of playwriting. In each of the five modules, you are taken through a number of specially tailored writing exercises on a particular aspect of writing plays, culminating in a bridging exercise which you can submit for expert feedback from the literary department at the theatre. In addition to the text, the course also features exclusive interviews with award-winning playwrights offering their own perspectives on the subject under discussion. These writers include Lee Hall, 
Sheila Stevenson, Alan Plater and Polly Stenham. Your exercises will be saved in your own electronic journal. This journal can be used for your own notes and observations made during the modules. You can also share your work and the journal with your fellow students within the discussion forum. Here you can become part of an online community of aspiring playwrights. The course culminates at the end of the fifth module with the opportunity to submit a full-length play that you have written as a result of the skills gathered on the course. This script will receive a thorough critique and feedback from the Live Theatre Literary Department with advice on the next steps for your work and development. The solo version of the course is also available. This contains the contents of the course, the exercises and interviews, but without the elements of feedback, advice and full access to the discussion forum. Okay, that's it. That's beerplaywright.com. Thank you.